So welcome everybody to uh, today's panel discussion on the growth of securitization within online and marketplace lending. <coughs> My name is John Bunting and I'll be uh, moderating the panel. Uh, I work at Garrison Investment Group, which is a $4 billion private equity firm located here in New York City. Um, Garrison has been very active in this space. Um, to date, we bought almost 900 million <coughs> of consumer loans from Prosper and almost 225 million from Lending Club. Uh, in addition, we have completed five securitizations to date, which totaled almost 660 million in total bond issuance. In addition, one of our six platform companies is a company called Foundation, which originates online small business working capital loans. Today, uh, we are lucky to have a panel that represents a full spectrum of market viewpoints. We have loan origination, risk management, servicer, rating agencies, and investment banks represented. So with that, uh, mindful of the very short time period that we have today, I'll turn it over for uh, short introductions. Uh, hi, uh, I was actually pretty impressed with the panelists, um, but the moderator looks pretty impressive too. Um, I'm Nino Fanlo, I'm the Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer of SoFi. Um, SoFi I think is uh, fairly unusual for, for Lended in that we target a super prime customer, what we consider the premium early career professional. Um, the folks that we would describe are 25 to 40, north of 720 FICO, 100,000 um, plus dollar uh, income. We are uh, three and a half years at it. Um, our business was built around student loans. Today we're very active now in mortgages and personal loans. We've had 27,000 customers. We have one 30-day delinquency. Um, the business has uh, grown very rapidly. I think we were the fastest company to get to one billion, the fastest company to get to two billion will be the fastest company to three billion sometime early in the third quarter and hopefully the fastest company to four billion sometime at the end of this year. Um, pleased to tell you we have 233 terrific people that work in San Francisco, Healdsburg, Montana, DC, and Dallas. We have um, a commitment to provide superior products. All of our products have no fee, no prepayment penalty, no um, processing fees, and I think we have products that are at the lowest price points at their product sets in literally every case with the exception of 75 to 80% mortgages, both 85 to 90, as well as below 50% mortgages. We're probably the premium pricing. Securitization relevant to this conversation and some of the colleagues here has assisted us as well as the institutional backers that have purchased loans from banks, insurance companies, asset managers. We believe that the capital markets are a critical element to proving out your business. They provide transparency and a roadmap and we have worked with rating agencies and investment banks to make sure that investors can clearly see what they are purchasing. We believe that our theories of free cash flow analysis for individuals lead to better underwriting decisions and greater transparency. As the previous speaker said, we believe free cash flow matters. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie Ye. I'm a director at Credit Suisse in our consumer and commercial asset finance group. We've been um, very involved in the space. We're one of the leaders in the securitization market and have been working to develop the securitization market here for both platforms that hold their loans on balance sheet as well as platforms that have been selling their loans to loan purchasers and working with those loan purchasers, primarily Garrison and also BlackRock to securitize those portfolios. We also um, we opened the 144A market last July with Garrison's first transaction and then also took BlackRock and Prosper through the rating agency process at Moody's um, to get that deal rated and syndicated into the capital markets. So happy to talk about that on the panel today. Uh, hi, I'm Lu Jun Yuan. I'm head of the capital markets at uh, OnDeck. Uh, OnDeck is a technology-powered lending platform uh, solely focused on small business. Uh, we run a very interesting uh, platform. Uh, we run a hybrid funding strategy where we use bank lines as well as securitization. 
Um, and uh, we also have a marketplace where institutional investors can actually purchase whole loan from on deck as well. Uh, we completed a, the, the first non-SBA um, um, small business loan securitization last year. Uh, and um, um, the, the marketplace is growing uh, very well as well. Uh, and I'm happy to you know, talk talk further uh, about, uh, you know, the development in the securitization market and, and uh, how, uh, how on deck is uh, building a very diversified funding platform to, uh, to ensure that our, all of our customers, uh, the small business, will get financing uh, through uh, very stable financing over a period of time. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Larry Shavaro. I'm the Executive Vice President from First Associates. Um, First Associates is a 28-year-old loan servicing company. Um, proud to say that we have over 100 of our clients attending Lendit this year. We provide primary and backup servicing for many different assets across the spectrum. Uh, we've been participating in many of the public uh, work with Stephanie and, and Will on the, the BlackRock uh, uh, Moody's rated securitization, uh, work with John on all John securitizations, recently completed the Blue Elephant um, private securitization, uh, and have others lined up here as well. Um, really excited to be here today and uh, share some of our insight on the securitization market. Thanks, and I'm uh, Will Black. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I head up Moody's uh, primary ratings, uh, primary ABS ratings team. Uh, we define that universe as credit cards, student loans, autos, and then uh, commercial, what we call commercial and esoteric asset classes. Of course, that includes marketplace lending. We have, as you've heard, a couple of touch points for rated securitization, both with SoFi and the so-called Seacolt, or some folks refer to it as the BlackRock or Prosper transaction, um, and countless other uh, certainly conversations uh, with many of you uh, in attendance today um, uh, with prospects of, of uh, securitizations in the, in the future. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ram Alawalia, the CEO and founder of PureIQ. We create tools for institutional investors to analyze, access, and manage risk. We work with uh, leading platforms in the U.S. consumer personal loan market. Uh, my background is in consumer credit and the capital markets. Previously, was on the executive team for Bank of America Merrill Lynch uh, in their cards and executives um, deposits group. And my former life was an investor primarily in structured credit uh, funds as well as venture capital, including marketplace lending. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, first question goes to Stephanie. Um, how would you describe the current status of the market uh, for these types of loans? and? What are the recent developments that you have seen, if any? So there's certainly been a lot of developments. And as um, those of you who were at Ron Suber's talk yesterday afternoon, he sort of showed the trajectory of the industry and the participation at this conference. And I would say that within the securitization markets, there's also been similarly a very steep trajectory starting in 2013 with SoFi's initial securitization and also Eaglewood's private securitization that really opened the market. And at the end of 2013, we had done around uh, slightly over $200 million of deals. Moving forward to last year with the opening of the 144A market with Garrison's deal, on deck enter the market with their rated securitization. We did about a billion dollars of um, issuance in the ABS markets backed by marketplace loans. This year to date, we've already reached the billion dollar mark at um, the end of March, and so we expect significantly more. And so this is definitely a quickly growing market. It's also quickly evolving from four to private placements, placed to a handful of investors, to rated transactions syndicated out to 30 to 40 investors. And as that evolves, I think it's attracting more capital into the marketplace lending space and also really proving out these businesses is very important. And we'll continue to see the ABS market develop and become more sophisticated for these types of loans as um, more platforms and more investors access it. Great. Maybe I can put some numbers, just to, I know not everyone in the audience is, is extremely familiar with the securitization market. It's been mentioned a number of times throughout the conference, but um, just to put some numbers behind and put into context marketplace lending, 
in the overall securitization market as we've defined it in, in the ABS world. Last year, about 180 billion, round numbers, 200 billion in term issuance uh, ABS securities were, were issued. Um, and again, with the rated touch points that I spoke to earlier, that would, uh, if you total them together, last year and this year, you're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars worth of security. So um, in terms of the, the landscape, it's, it's, it's still quite a small presence. We've heard that, I think, uh, in several of the presentations today. Enormous market, generally speaking, uh, and I think marketplace lending, uh, as we'll discuss uh, further into the panel, uh, fits a lot of the characteristics of other asset classes that have been securitized, but with some notable differences, which we'll get into, but still very small in the, in the scheme of things. Ram, you're in contact with a lot of different market participants, whether they be buyers or issuers. You know, what do you see as some of the potential future developments in the securitization market? Sure. Well, let me uh, frame it up some context and get to specific predictions. So consumer credits transitioning to the capital markets, well, why? In a post-2008, post-crisis, post-Dodd-Frank, post-Card Act, Basel III environment, there's a major wedge between regulatory capital, which banks are subject to, and economic capital. Uh, as a result, non-bank lenders are taking up the slack. Now, non-bank lenders don't have access to cheap deposit financing, so they must rely on institutional capital to fund the growth of their businesses. Institutional investors, in turn, must achieve return targets for their LPs and other constituencies. And institutional investors tap the ABS markets to achieve those return and risk objectives. So some specific predictions. Number one is um, any large platform will feature securitization as an essential part of their funding strategy. It has to be the case because of the continued growth of the marketplace lending category. Uh, the ABS markets can provide the, su the support and capital necessary to fund that growth. Second, marketplace platforms must invest in technology and standards to support securitization. So standards might consist, for example, of uh, prepackaged uh, reps and warranties to simplify the securitization process, data rooms, and other kinds of things. Technology might consist of independent third-party uh, credit models that model out prepayment and default curves so you can have a standardized view and pricing of risk from a deconflicted uh, third party. As these tools and standards evolve in the space, I think you're gonna see an acceleration in securitization and improvement, improvement in terms of ratings, advance rate, and uh, also reduction in the cost of capital. And finally, I think over time you'll see the development of hedging instruments. Why is that? Well, institutional investors are required to hold paper for three or five year term and there's no liquidity, and that term might extend through a credit cycle. And institutional investors will seek hedging instruments so they can get comfortable holding that risk, and it makes the product offering for the platforms that much more attractive to their uh, investors. I think, I, you know, I think you bring up a, a very good point. I mean, you know, I think a, a lot of companies are built Build on P2P lending, but you know ultimately it, it is it is in the lending business. So even though some of the platforms that are balance sheet light, uh, where where just where, where they don't use balance sheet at all, it doesn't mean that uh, there's no balance sheet being used, right? I mean I think it create the marketplace creates a form of uh, a platform to originate, but you know it, I think more and more institutional investors are are looking at uh, online alternative lending as sort of a way to originate assets in the in the future, right? So I think you know from our personal experience, you know we we securitized uh, last year, and it was it was a pretty long process. But I think ultimately, you know where where you know I talked to a lot of investors, you know hedge funds, money managers, as well as the insurance company that you know initially were very skeptical in terms of what this online lending platform is, uh, and I think people are. You know, lending, alternative lending is really moving mainstream, and I think a lot more institutional investors are getting a lot more comfortable with, with this space. And I think that helps the securitization market in general because ultimately, uh, securitization is a way for people to, to get leverage because the, 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 the person who purchases a loan is going to hold that assets at a yield hurdle that they're willing to hold onto. Uh, and uh, the more long term money insurance and insurance company and banks are getting to the space and getting comfortable with how alternative assets are being originated, uh, ultimately helps 
um, alternative lending going more mainstream? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll just share some statistics to help put in context securitization. I'll use the credit card world as an example. Back in, in 2007, there were almost a trillion dollars worth of credit card receivables outstanding. About 32% of those uh, were financed through the securitization market. Now, fast forward to today, it's much less than that. It's about half of that 16% uh, of the total outstanding, which has also shrunk to about 800 billion now. Um, is being financed through the securitization market. And that, that's happened, that contraction in, in the proportion through the, securitization, through the securitization market has happened for a variety of reasons, um, uh, some of which are just simply cheap deposit money funding uh, competing with securitization. Um, I think it's important to bear in mind that securitization is just another funding source, and ideally, you would like to have as many funding sources if you're running a company as, as, you, as you can. It's typical, though, that uh, startups or uh, uh, companies that are less uh, well developed, shall we say, um, have fewer uh, funding sources um, to their to their um, to avail themselves to, and, and securitization uh, tends to be attractive to uh, to many of them. Okay, great. Uh, next question is focused to Nino and Lou. Um, as loan originators, so we were talking about a lot of the the difficulties for maybe smaller buyers or even loan originators, how do you guys think about the positives and negatives of securitization um, uh, when it comes to, and, and how does that differ from people who are balance sheeting their own assets as opposed to those that have to think about, as you said, this is a, this is a financing tool, right? It doesn't matter who owns it, somebody has to finance it. So what are the different considerations that you guys give to that? <clears throat> I, I think Will and others have made the point about how important it is to diversify your funding. If you take a step behind that, equally important is to build processes and disciplines that are repetitive, recurring, and understanding. What securitization does is forces you into a discipline of not just telling a story pleasantly with anecdotes to a group of, of receptive folks, but to fill out a thorough checklist that is verified by independent people that other people can trust. That discipline is extraordinarily useful for any company, but particularly useful for a new company. Because a new company needs incredible discipline improvement in every single area, in technology, marketing, capital markets. So that exercise is extraordinarily sensible, and it is very bracing. I think that's the, the best word, to go through it and to be challenged by people that are are, are placed in an objective time frame across credit cycles to make sure that the story hangs. And that, if you balance it with other costs, with other varying forms of, of capital sourcing, gives you a mosaic of how you reduce capital costs, you broaden your investor base, and then importantly, in what we do, really reduce your cost of goods sold. Because capital for us, this is not like a Google search, we have to deliver 100 cents. There isn't an infinite margin. The loan can be worth 103, 104, but you have to get really efficient at your cost of goods sold. And anyone that doesn't see this as a plausible tool to not just expand their business, but to think about this as a useful mechanism of disciplining your processes and credit, operations, marketing, internal audit, and communication as a vital tool to improving your business misses, I think, a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think um, I would agree with you. Know, I think you know, securitization. We, we securitization is, is one of the ways on deck fund ourselves. I think, you know, what makes us unique is we have we have we're running a hybrid model where we use our own balance sheet as well as we have marketplace. I think on the balance sheet side of the business, securitization is very scalable. Uh, it does provide us with very, very efficient cost of fund. I think also, you know, the scalability is important, right? Because we're a high growth company and, and, and I think, you know, if you look at our loan origination volume, year over year has been growing 150% a year. Uh, we want a scalable market to be, able to, to be able to fund our origination and I think securitization is very scalable. Uh, but diversity is also very important. Ultimately is how do you 
build a investor base, whether it's through balance sheet securitization or through marketplace, how do you not only build a diversity of investors and build a portfolio of investors that has very low correlations or as low a correlation as you can get to? Uh, and I think you know, securitization allows people to come in to get exposure to this asset class and pick the risk they, they're willing to take. Um, so, you know, insurance company can, can sort of, you know, sort of get into the, the investment grade bond, bond that we issue and hedge funds probably can take sort of more of the subordinated bond that's, high, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, rated below investment grade. I think another thing that securitization does for us is, is, is validation, right? I mean, if you think about, you know, on deck, uh, is FICO has historically not been a good uh, indicator of credit risk for small businesses, and on deck uses a lot of mainstream data as well as alternative data to create this concept of on deck score, which is we, which is how we um, assess the credit risk of a small business and and and, and make our credit decisions and pricing decisions. Uh, and I think if you look at our securitization, you know, the rating agency came in and did a tremendous amount of work. Um, to look at our historical performances, and our transaction was reg was basically governed by on deck score <coughs> rather than by FICO score, um, and you know I think that's a huge validation to the, the credit model that we, we have built internally, and I think that also gives the market on the other side, the marketplace side of the investors, gives people a lot of comfort that there's a, there's third party that's 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 gone through a lot of you know data. Uh, uh, check data checking, uh, looked at our operations, looked at our underwritings, looked at our collection practice, you know, looked at our audits, uh, and really got comfortable with, with on deck as a company and, and as an originator. So I think you know, we, we, really view, we really view sort of the, the, the marketplace and the balance sheet and the securitization side of the business to be checks and balances, and it creates um, a, a diversity as well as a, a competition if you would, in terms of, in terms of uh, what's the best way to fund ourselves and what's the best way to scale our business going forward. And so, John, if you look at our panel last year here at Lendit, there was a handful of securitizations, whether they were private or a couple public securitizations. Um, fast forward a year, you know, we're in somewhat of the 20s between all of the private and the uh, public transactions, including a, you know, a duly rated S&P and DBRS transaction for, for merchant cash advance. Um, and, so it's, and then obviously the BlackRock transaction, which was uh, pretty popular in the market. And you know, what, what's really interesting about this is that a year ago, maybe there was one or two investment banks that were actively in the space. And today, all of the investment banks are building out a piece to you know, go after some of this uh, securitization. So Ron said it yesterday, the securitization market is here. I think this time next year when we're sitting on the panel, We'll probably be in the you know 40s or 50s at this point. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to um, Lou and Nina's point. I think the validation is important. Also, obviously, this alternative source of capital is another tool and platforms toolboxes as they look at their growth trajectory. But talking a bit about platforms that are selling their loans. I think there is a bit of a different nuance there. And as you're going through the ratings process, you have an additional party involved being the loan purchaser as well as the loan um, the platform originating the loan and the loan servicer. And that is definitely an exercise to go to where um, the rating agencies and the investors, especially on the investors on unrated deals, are really going underneath the hood and trying to figure out what's going on operationally, how the underwriting criteria works, and really diligencing the company. And I think that is um, an exercise in different priorities between the different parties that needs to be managed and balanced. And also, I think as we evolve in this marketplace, the right balance for that is still evolving and something that everyone is working towards figuring out a model that works consistently. And a follow-up question for the panel. You, know, you see it, it's growing, right? And, and you know, well, you just mentioned all of the things that you guys need to do, all of the checklists and all of the diligence and the people who need to run through here. You know, right now you're saying we've got 20 deals, right? So we have all of these institutions who are selling the loans and the ultimate buyers are going to have to buy the deals, right? And structure the deals themselves. That doesn't mean that that alleviates all of the pressure on the originator of the loan because if you're doing a securitization because you bought the loan from company X, there still needs to be legal and, and um, uh, company due diligence and that's a lot of time and effort. You know, how do you th see things moving in the future because 100 different 
securitization deals with 100 different you know, legal advisors and different investment banks, that is going to be a massive amount of work. Uh, anybody on the panel, how do you see things changing going forward? I mean, I can speak for us to say that we've done this to try to show a blueprint for investors. So there's going to be investors in on our transactions who um, will use the tool and we will assist them uh, to do it. So I think the way we see it is we've held these assets for sh increasingly short periods of time, but we see our role is to provide a mechanism for people to buy whole loans that then get permanent financing. So we have privity with the investors that want the actual assets and the securities that are created and then investment banks and others distribute portions of the assets. I would expect models like that would develop. The very largest asset managers, BlackRock is an obvious example. Folks are very, very focused on access to product and that's in high quality product, riskier product, equity product. I think there's an evolution that the largest asset managers among the primary objectives is access to product. In your firm, I know your colleague Steve Stewart well, the firms that are thoughtful and smart think how do we build an investment management business that is more appealing to our investors. And one of the most appealing things is the ability to source and create products. So I think you'll see a group of people that become more dominant investors in the assets. Uh, truthfully, I think smaller participants will have a lower contribution in the overall growth. And you'll see, like you see in a lot of asset management businesses and origination businesses, a group of people that tend to have predominant share and probably dominate the growth in the markets. And I think that's the path that most businesses follow, certainly technology businesses, but the vast majority of businesses lead to dominant players and then niche players. John, yeah, I definitely um, want to underscore that, underscore that pain point. I don't want to get into the debate around whether marketplace lending is a new origination channel or a new asset class, but it's certainly a new business model. And we're still testing this. There are different considerations around reps and warranties. They vary from platform to platform. Different dealers have different expectations as well. So I think we'll solve it through technology and standards. Those need to evolve. There's some discussion perhaps around standardized, prepackaged reps and warranties. I think that may be difficult. We gotta work through that. There's some discussion around perhaps rolling up smaller ABS sponsors in one securitization so they can enjoy the benefits of diversified capital. There are challenges there as well because typically smaller funds are actively picking loans and now they'd be subject to the cross default risk um, from their other uh, members. So not sure what the answer is other than it'll include technology standards and, and a healthy dose of innovation. I also think, you know, there is a risk to concentrating your buyer base, right? So you talked about diversity of funding. You also need diversity of buyers, right? So you can't put too many eggs in one basket because you're exposing your platform to risk. So, you know, I, I can envision something where you have a, uh, a pool into which smaller buyers uh, put their loans and then there's a securitization that comes out of their, their smaller pool because I think the smaller buyers always have to be a part of this marketplace just to keep that diversity. Yeah. I, mean, it, it, I agree with that and I think to your point, I think standardization is going to be a big part of that. I think that's really important. Standardization consistency for accessing the term ABS market is key. The platforms that issue the most you know, across the consumer ABS space, such as a Ford or a GM Financial in the auto space or some of the large credit card platforms, their collateral looks exactly the same from deal to deal. Their FICO doesn't deviate more than a couple of points. Their structures look exactly the same and maybe as performance is improving, they put in a bit less credit enhancement, they adjust it slightly, but the structures and the reps and warranties and everything look exactly the same from deal to deal. And I, so when I said in my opening comments that this market is still evolving even though we have reached a lot of great benchmarks in the market, I think that the standardization is key and eventually to get lower cost of funds and to get more capital through the term ABS market, there does need to be a level of standardization that occurs here, whether it's by platform or based on a large investor that is doing multiple deals a year, knowing that their deal looks exactly the same every time, I think that's going to be very important. But so far, you might think. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I think standardization definitely is a problem. 
is, is one of the solutions. I and mean, I think we're, we're actually trying to keep uh, all the marketplace participants on our platform, uh, you know, with standard information, to information, information flow as well as the same documentation. I think the other thing sort of puts us in a unique position is because we run a balance sheet business. Uh, part of my job is just talking to various lenders and secure, you know, securitization buyers on a daily basis. Uh, so if you think about, you know, on deck on the balance sheet side, we always have a relationship with different lenders in this space. So I think the advantage comes in where um, our marketplace investor, when they try to go get leverage in the market, um, people know us already. People probably have to perform due diligence on us already. And I think you know, there's inf efficiency to be gained over time for us to uh, potentially go talk to lenders and you know, buy leverage in bulk, so to speak. So you know, allow people to you know, purchase our assets levered or unlevered because we know the lenders already and we know who, who's comfortable with our credit risk and the loans that we originate. Uh, and uh, that helps the people on our marketplace side as well to get leverage in the market and, and, and to build a bigger portfolio. Great. Next question is for you, Will. Um, you know, online lending, you can argue that that's not new. It's been around for a long time. But certainly the selling of loans and securitizations being done by third-party buyers is something that's relatively new. What are some of the major concerns that you could see for rating agencies or bond buyers that would stifle the growth of this market? Right. So, I mean, I, I guess when we, when we sat down with SoFi and, and, and uh, and the folks from, from Prosper and BlackRock and talk, talk to them about their um, securitizations. You know, I can break down kind of the analysis um, or the, you know, the, the risk uh, points in four categories. Um, and, and you can kind of apply this to, to virtually all the marketplace lenders, um, uh, at least the ones that I'm familiar with. There's data. Um, there's history or time in business, there's what I call operational plumbing, and then regulatory resilience. So I'll go through each <coughs> one of those. Data, to start out with, probably the, the, the area where marketplace lenders have the greatest strength, um, by far, they hit it out of the park relative to many other uh, traditional lenders, is they have a lot of, they're collecting a lot of data, and on, on top of that, they're sharing a lot of data. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of transparency with respect to uh, the data they're collecting on their assets. And uh, they're sharing that not only with the rating agencies, uh, but they're sharing that with their lenders and uh, both l institutional and uh, retail alike. So there's a lot of data out there, but I would separate uh, very carefully and quickly quantity of that data with quality. Um, so there is a lot of data. We've all heard, uh, and I've been uh, with Moody's now for 17 years, I've, I've heard through a couple of different business cycles now, uh, a number of lenders tell, uh, explain to me how they've cracked the code on uh, mining uh, new data points uh, and that they know how to price for certain risk, et cetera, and it works for a little while and then things turn out not to work uh, uh, according to plan when uh, the, the business environment turns a little more challenging, shall we say. Um, so, you know, it, much has been talked about the, uh, the, the, the relatively untested nature of the ramp up of uh, asset creation that's occurred over the last several years in one of the most benign credit environments um, of, our, of our generation, you might say. Um, and, and so there's a, a difference, again, in, in the terms of data between back testing, which I think all, all marketplace lenders are doing to some extent. They're looking back at the credit crisis and using uh, this metadata to analyze what kind of coverage or cushion they have to cover losses should the financial crisis of the mid-2000s repeat itself. But I would caution against that kind of analysis as well because, of course, the next crisis isn't going to look exactly like the, the last crisis. And a lot of things came together to help out certain segments of consumer lending, in particular uh, credit cards we can again, is a natural kind of uh, focal point for some uh, uh, unsecured uh, marketplace lenders. Um, and you could argue that a lot of uh, credit card issuers were, in, es in essence, bailed out uh, of some of their risk or a lot of their risk by mortgage lenders or home equity lines of credit, um, which has been spoken about again in, in other panels. 
um, a lot of that risk was taken off the table in, in refinancing products of that, of that uh, ilk. So uh, to use the multiples of, well, the credit card industry experienced you know, two and a half, three times losses in the last credit crisis, so as long as I have that kind of a buffer in my uh, projections, uh, you know, everyone should get out whole, just might, it might be a red herring. It's, it, it's just something that we, none of us know the answer to, uh, and that's part of uh, the challenge of, of rating some of these platforms for which we don't have a lot of history. So that brings me to the second point, talked about data. History is limited here. This is where market, most marketplace lenders anyway have um, you know, some proving to do, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of that proving can only happen with experience, as I just described. I mean, again, there are a lot of, well, to put it in perspective, there are not that many, but there are a number of um, platforms that have failed over the last 15 years um, in the consumer, and particularly in the unsec unsecured consumer lending space. Um, Highland Myers, Nextcard, Advanta, um, you know, Providian was a was a, a another example of a, of a credit card issuer that was that was barely made it through uh, the, the skin of their teeth, um, being bought by Chase, uh, and there are, there are others um, uh, uh, that that I could name, and, and we can go into more detail perhaps in, in the Q and A session. Um, the third factor, which we've covered a little bit, um, I probably Larry, you can speak to, uh, to 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 some degree as well, is, is operational plumbing. I call it. And this is the due diligence um, that we conduct and, and that is done by folks who get to the table before we do in terms of the bankers, um, but making sure that the uh, cash flow, uh, the cash allocations, the um, servicing, um, backup servicing, et cetera, is our, those elements of uh, conducting business are in place and that the third parties that are brought in to conduct those types of businesses uh, or that take on those responsibilities are capable of stepping in and stepping in quickly should the originator um, should the originator go out of business. I know that's that's a little bit um, uh, difficult for many in this room to hear, but you know, as a rating agency, we are thinking about worst case scenarios, and we do kind of have to assume, particularly for startup companies, that they're going to go away, and we have to when, because we're rating securities that are divorced from the credit of the originator much higher typically than what the originator itself would be rated. So we kind of have to assume that the, the originator is gone. Okay, does the music still continue to play? Does the cash still get allocated to the right accounts and get, made, uh, get paid to investors? Are, are the obligors going to continue to pay on their debt when the originator is no longer there and when, when we're in a crisis? And lastly, uh, regulatory resilience, again, a lot of unknowables there. We can see the kind of regulatory scrutiny that, is, uh, that the auto industry, for example, is undertaking today uh, with a whole alphabet soup list of, of regulators that are investigating, fining, um, et cetera, uh, that industry. I think marketplace lending is getting a bit of a buy right now, a little bit, a bit of a pass in some respects because they're new. Um, they don't have the kind of scale that some of these stalwart industries have. And, um, and also, I think there's a good argument that they're wearing the so-called white hats in the industry right now. They're offering loans that, that certainly on their face appear to be consumer friendly, um, offering lower rates than what consumers could otherwise get, or a loan to begin with that consumers couldn't otherwise get. Um, and, and, and I think that's also helping, uh, at least for now. But of course, you can lend with a white hat on and still uh, violate uh, regulations, as again we've we've spoken about in in several panels uh, before this one. So, John, why don't I jump on and expand on number three for Will? So, um, our business at First Associates, we're servicing um, between seven and eight billion dollars in assets today, and that breaks out about fifty percent primary and fifty percent backup. So, we'll talk about the need for backup servicing to uh, to Will's point. So, backup servicing is required on. Uh, whether it's a warehousing facility, a leverage line, or securitization, or sometimes a um, originating bank like Cross River or such will require that. And typically, if the originator is not a AAA rated company or it's a new asset or there may be another mitigating factor, the rating agency to rate the transaction will request uh, a backup service or someone like us. And so you're gonna hear terms out there that we want a backup servicer 
to be able to stand in as the primary servicer and become the successor if there is a default on the term of the servicer. And you'll hear terms of cold, warm, and hot, and I said it last year, um, I, I really don't like those terms because they're terms that were developed by folks 15 and 20 years ago that really don't have any bearing on today's market. So if we were the um, cold servicer, cold backup servicer, and there was a default by the originator, by the rating agency's terms, um, we would have to take over in 90 days. So just think about that, right? So what would happen in 90 days? We would not be able to protect and preserve the cash flow, as you had mentioned, and mitigate the loss. So we typically have developed a hybrid approach where um, we'll get daily, weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly files from the originator. They typically come over electronically. We'll store them on our standby data system. Uh, monthly or, again, bi-weekly, we'll go into the data, we'll take their services report, and we'll validate five or ten different items uh, on the report, and issue a certificate that we did the work. Um, and if um, we don't get the services report, we'll have to go back to the investors or the book runners on the deal and the agencies and say, hey, guys, we didn't get the report and we need to, to cure it. And so, um, uh, believe it or not, last year we were involved in two successor servicer events where there was a trigger on a warehousing facility where we had to take over. And so um, we need to make sure that we're ready to do that, protect the cash, move over ACHs, send out goodbye hello letters, contact borrowers electronically however we can uh, to preserve um, the cash flow. So it's, it's really, really critical today. In regards to Prosper, um, we've been working with Prosper for about a year and a half. We are, if you want to use the term, super hot backup, where by contract, we have a five-day conversion. So if Prosper had a default, we would have to take over all of those loans in five days. And then all of the leverage providers, whether it would be Cap One, Cap Source, BMO, Goldman, Morgan, Credit Suisse, um, whereas they're providing leverage, we have separate contracts with the originators, including John's funds, to provide a extra level of backup servicing on there to protect it. And so I uh, hope that clarifies <coughs> a little bit and expands on, on your answer there. I mean, it's in interesting as an originator and issuer ourselves, you know, I think operational readiness is a very serious thing. You know, I think uh, the irony that I always say to get access to the securitization, the first thing you have to do is get rating agency, like feel comfortable that your ongoing concern as the originator and the servicer, you will be alive for a very long time. The moment they get comfortable that you will be alone for a very long time, they assume you go away and the, the, the transaction still will perform very well. So, um, you know, so like before we, you know, so if you think about prior to us getting into the securitization market, we actually had bank line financing and warehouse line financing. And we spent a lot of time to design the program initially to operate within a securitization environment, even though those were not rated securitizations. Uh, I think that gives, you know, the same things, the, the trustees, the custodians, the backup servicers. I think all that um, operating in a securitization environment gets the rating agency very comfortable with you by the time you do a securitization because you're not just piecing those things together at the last minute. So talking about the investors as well, because that was part of John's question, I think that the um, having done a number of unrated deals and then also through the BlackRock Prosper deal, having talked to a number of investors that would look at this as a rated deal and would invest in this, they have very similar concerns to the rating agencies in this market. And while they may take a bit of a more short-term view because they're more concerned about the time period for their specific investment to pay down and the class A's on most of these deals, um, at least in the for three and five year unsecured consumer installment loans, is you know less than a year and a half. And so they're taking more of a view on perhaps the consumer credit market during that period than the rating agencies who take more of a long-term view to legal final of the transaction. So, um, but the topics that they're concerned about are very similar and I think that as we're developing this market, that's going to be where the focus is. And then going back to my consistency point earlier, I think that in the next year or two, as we've developed that and gotten comfortable with those issues and have settled a bit, then the consistency is what's going to continue driving down cost of funds and improving advance rates. Right, there. so Stephanie, so it's in many cases a philosophical approach, the rating versus the non-rated right. transaction, right? What is the difference? But if the standardization is there, okay, and is there, a difference of execution based upon the transaction. I think the concerns 
whether it's rated or non-rated would be the same, correct? Yeah, I think when we have worked on unrated transactions and taken investors, they have done um, a lot of due diligence. They've talked to, in cases where the loan purchaser is doing the securitization, they've talked to the platform about their underwriting and their servicing. They've wanted to understand the backup servicing procedures that have been put in place. So we get very similar questions to what Will's team asked when we took the SQL transaction to get rated. I'm sure that Lou and Nina have gone through when they've gotten their deals rated, it um, may be to a different level, and I think Will's team brings a lot more insight on history within the consumer finance space and um, companies that are no longer around and sort of what went wrong there, digging into that. But investors have very similar concerns, and so I think they're, the things that can slow down the development here are very similar in both aspects. A growing and changing market, as you could hear, uh, and thank you very much to all of our panelists for the great presentation today.